Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker. This is Bruce Goddard, and you're listening to the View from a Hearse podcast. As we kick off 2024 on this podcast, I want to begin with a few personal thoughts and then let you in on a project I'm working on. First, I was reminded in December that life throws things at us that we do not expect. It happens to all of us, that is for sure. Maybe for some more than others, but it happens. For instance, I started off in December 2023 with four brothers-in-law three on my wife's side of the family and one on my side. By Christmas, the count had been cut in half. Most of us are fortunate to have many friends and a few close friends. There's also an inner circle of family and friends that can be closer. These are people you vacation with, do holidays with, and intentionally spend quality time with. On December 17th, Kathy's younger sister, Mia, lost her husband of some 16 years. Tom O'Malley suddenly had a stroke one evening at their home in Florida and spent the last 10 or so days of his life in a hospital, never speaking again. Tom was seemingly well one minute and gone the next. We have all seen that play out many times in our lives. We never know what a day will bring. With Tom's death, Mia has much to untangle and figure out what happens next. And her life is forever changed, and so was their son's life. Then on Christmas Day, Mike Waller, my sister Kiki's husband, died right in front of her. Mike had been diagnosed with cancer the Friday before Thanksgiving. The diagnosis was unexpected. He was halfway through the chemotherapy treatment, and they were at home. He got up to use the bathroom, came back short of breath, and died. I had talked to Mike and Kiki a few hours earlier. Although they both knew the prognosis was not good, they had no idea it would happen that quickly and without warning. Kiki's life was forever changed, as were the lives of Mike's two daughters. Tom and Mia did not know that death was imminent. Mike and Kiki knew that Mike's life would be cut short, but they were praying for more time together. Why does this stuff happen? People have been trying to answer that since the beginning of time. I won't try here. But as a God-fearing believer, I have no choice but to believe in a sovereign God in complete control. He sees it all from a different and better perspective and is in complete control. For me, that is comforting. These families have been surprised at what unfolded in December, but God was not surprised. Some may ask then, why pray at all? If God is sovereign and will do what he will do, why even ask God to answer our prayers? Please know I am not a theologian. I'm an undertaker. But I think there are at least two answers to that question. One, there are examples in Scripture where God seemingly changed his mind because of the pleas of his people. And we have all seen God answer our prayers. We have seen miracles and are amazed at things only he could do. We have all seen our feeble prayers seemingly move a sovereign God. I believe the second reason we pray was illustrated plainly to me in a Waffle House last weekend. My middle son and I decided to make a Waffle House run one morning while he was visiting. The place was packed, so we sat on the only available stools at the counter. We were both big guys and we were sitting next to big guys. Our shoulders were rubbing our neighbor's shoulders. It was not comfortable. As we got our food, we noticed the elderly gentleman on John's left was writing on paper as he drank his coffee. I had no idea what he was writing, nor did I care, but John could not help but see he had written with large letters at the top of the page, prayer list. 
John said he had two items on his list. First, he had a brother who was in a health crisis in an Atlanta hospital. He named the hospital. His prayer was for him to get well and be discharged from the hospital. Secondly, he was praying for his son who seemed to be on the wrong path. That was it. Nothing complicated at all. Those two people were heavy on this man's heart. His response was to pray. He continued to drink his coffee and stared at the words he had written. He finally folded the paper, put it in his front pocket, paid his bill, and left. My impression was that he knew he had done all he could, and he was completely content with that and the outcome. He could not make his brother well and certainly could not change the road his son was on. But he could release the load he was carrying. Many of us spend much frantic energy trying to control the outcome of whatever concerns us. This man quietly and powerfully gave his burden to God. So I learned a powerful lesson. We certainly pray to move God but we also pray to give him our burdens and concerns and to trust him with the outcome. Now, you may be excused if you don't attend Sunday school this Sunday because you just heard a freeing and powerful Sunday school lesson from a man I have never even met. Now that the lesson is over, I'll be back to discuss the special project I'm working on in 2024. Several weeks ago, a friend called me and told me he wanted me to take him to my hometown, Reynolds, Georgia, and show him some of the sites I have spoken about and written about. I've been asked to do that several times, but have yet to follow through. I told him to come up with a list, and I'd take him wherever he wanted. We set a date. I picked him up, and we headed to Reynolds. His first request was to see the church where the preacher had the best beginning of a funeral service I ever heard, when he began that funeral by saying, that was a little tight. I think my friend wanted to know if it really happened. Some of you remember that story. The preacher was a large man and got his rear end wedged in the pulpit chair, and as the funeral director, I had to unwedge him in front of God and everybody at the beginning of that funeral. It caused quite a commotion that day, but the only option was for him to stand at the podium with the big chair attached to his butt. I took him to that church first, but it was not in Reynolds, and it was locked. He did not see the chair, but he did see the church, and he took plenty of pictures. Then we went to Reynolds and drove around while I showed him some places he was interested in. We visited three different cemeteries, Hillcrest and Reynolds being the last. Walking around the cemeteries, I had stories at almost every grave we visited. I spoke briefly of the family's history, who they were, and what they did in Reynolds. At many of the grave sites, an anecdote or two came to mind. It struck me that he did not even know these folks, but was captivated by the stories under those stones. So I have been thinking about how to record these stories for posterity. Should someone walk with me with a camera, video, and the markers in my stories? I'm thinking I'll be 70 this year. I was a fourth generation funeral director in this town, and I know a lot through my own experience or stories passed down from my daddy or granddaddy. If I don't preserve the stories of these wonderful families for future generations, they will be lost forever. As I pondered all that, I got a call from a friend who grew up in Reynolds and is now a medical doctor in another state. He was asking me questions about the history of the schools in Reynolds. During that conversation, I told him about the day I had spent recently with my friend in Reynolds, and I was trying to figure out what to do. He immediately responded, Bruce, you need to write these stories. 
He said it a couple more times before we finished the conversation. Please do it, he said. So a few days later, I began my new project. I started by going to the Find a Grave website and pulled up every grave marker in Hillcrest Cemetery in Reynolds. I then created a spreadsheet and ended up with about 250 names. As of today, I'm about halfway done writing these stories about these families. I'm including a photo of the grave marker and a paragraph or sometimes two about the person buried there. I will not include everyone in the cemetery in my writings, but I will include many. The stories are touching and inspiring, and some will make you chuckle or maybe even laugh out loud. I'm sure the people who live, have lived, or have families who resided in Reynolds and Taylor County will be thoroughly entertained and inspired by these stories. But the more I write, the more I believe people who have never been to Reynolds will be entertained and inspired. After all, many of us still watch Andy and Barney in Mayberry, and we've never been there. So stay tuned, and I'll update you as I move forward. And this will probably end up in a book. If not, I'll go to Kinko and get copies made. As I begin 2024, I will spend a lot of time with my wife of almost 47 years and as much time with my grandchildren as possible. I plan to continue to have interesting guests on this podcast, and I'm writing a book that will most likely be entitled, There Are Stories Under Those Stones. And with it all, I'm having a blast. By the way, everybody has a story. If you have a story to tell or know someone who does, just let me know, and I'll invite you to be on this podcast. Your children, grandchildren, and descendants who have not even been born yet will one day thank you. I hope you all have a great 2024. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker.